Welcome to Open Source for Researchers, a podcast showcasing open source software built by and for researchers. My name's Abby. And I'm Avlam. And we're your hosts. Every other week, we interview an author published in the Journal of Open Source Software, or JOS. This is episode 18. And today we chatted with Brenda Progastis about their paper HyperNet X, a Python package for modeling complex network data as hypergraphs. Brenda's a mathematician and data scientist at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. So this is our second graph-related episode. We had the Thinking in Graphy Ways one. Oh, you're right. That long ago, right? <laughs> I'm super into graphs, even more than I was before that one. This was yeah. very interesting. That's what did you learn about on this in this conversation, Abby? This was good. I took a couple of graph theory classes in university. I did study hypergraphs at one point. I knew what they were. But okay. <laughs> But it's been a while, so I didn't let on during our conversation. I could tell you were asking some smart <laughs> questions. I was like, what? Where's this coming from? Anyway, it turns out hypergraphs that sort of represent real things in the world, right? So it's really interesting to learn about the variety of domains that those can be applied. And so, yeah, yeah I was struck by how useful they seem to be. Yeah. So, so that was a real learning experience for me. Yeah, because we don't just have these pairwise relationships. We interact in groups. We interact like much broader things. So hypergraph makes a lot of sense for that. So it's great yeah. to see the library that uh, Brenda started that has these methods for hypergraph analysis, has extra metrics, extra attributes for hypergraphs that I didn't know about. And he's yeah. been working with other hypergraph libraries to try to standardize how the data gets exchanged. So I thought that was awesome. Yeah, it sounds like there's a really good vibrant ecosystem here of related tools, lots of things. So yeah, it was a uh... Great library and author to have on today. Yeah, it was great having you there. All right, let's play the interview. Let's do it. Welcome to the podcast, Brenda. Thanks for joining us today. Yeah, we're so glad to have you here. I am happy to be here. Okay, so perhaps, Brenda, you can kick us off by telling us a bit about what a hypergraph is. Yeah, well, when you put hyper in front of something, it's good to know what we're talking about. Hyper what? So what is a graph, first of all? Everybody has um, seen graphs, but mathematicians have a very specific thing in mind when they talk about graphs. So what mathematicians think about are relationships between things. And so uh, graphs model pairwise relationships between objects and some network of things. So you can think of an airport map, which has all the hubs around the world and lines between them if there's a direct flight between them, for example. So that would be a graph. And uh, you can think of a family tree where you have lines between people who have direct familial relationships with each other. And you can imagine these graphs can get really big and complicated, for example, if you want to model power grid. And data scientists are often asked to look for anomalies or interesting aspects of these graphs. Well, graphs are fantastic tools, but often relationships are a lot more complicated than just pairwise relationships. Now, imagine a, a network with multi-way relationships. For example, higher order biological interactions between groups of proteins. That's one of the things we study at the lab. Or social interactions between groups of individuals. You might think of political parties and people that migrate or maybe, you know, hedge their bets and go to both places. We can look at bibliometrics data, for example, tracing the relationships between publications. You can have a paper that's been written by many authors. And so you can look at the relationships between papers in terms of the authors who wrote them. So those are examples of relationships that can't be modeled very well just using pairwise models of graphs. So that's where we use hypergraphs. And so the mathematical models with hypergraphs, we can now apply the same kinds of tools we do with graphs to hypergraphs. Can I just test my understanding of a hypergraph then? So a friendship between two people is a simple graph relationship, right? It's like... Yeah myself and Abby, for example, would a friend group or communities of friends to model that's already now become a hypergraph? Like the people who I know, the relationship is actually between a class that I was in at school at a particular period. There are relationships between those individuals still, but there's also a sort of meta relationship. Would that be a hypergraph? That's a great way of describing it. So if you can imagine a Venn awesome. diagram okay. Good. of the classes in your high school, right? Each class of people in that high school have individual nodes, which represent the students in that class. And some classes share lots of students, and some classes are completely disjoint. Maybe they took place at the same time. You can imagine a big Venn diagram of classes, and then you can kind of see, who are the people I went to class with? And that might be kind of fun to have in your school book at the end of the year. Nice. 
And Brenda, can you tell us a little bit about your background and why you're studying hypergraphs or working on this project? Yeah, that's kind of a funny story. I came late to the lab. I was a stay-at-home mom for quite a while after I went to graduate school and went to the lab after retraining in uh, Python development. And so when I first got to the lab, I was just doing some programming. But then a wonderful man named Cliff Joslin came to me and said, I see you're a mathematician. Do you know anything about, you know, homology theory and stuff? And he said, we study hypergraphs. And so I got into it just as a new thing, and it was so fun. I was able to use my Python tools to study them and to do the metrics on them. And the applications were interesting. You know, I work at at, um, National Lab, and they have interesting data that they get from the government that we can study. And I met a lot of interesting people. And it turns out there's a huge community of people who recognize the need for understanding communities as being able to model those communities and being able to understand how they interact with each other. So yeah, that's how I got into hypergraphs. And the fact that I knew Python when I came into the lab gave a great opportunity for me to do programming with hypergraphs. Very nice. I was curious, I think you mentioned it just before that you have some diagrams that you could show that kind of dig in a bit into sort of some of the examples of what graphs look like. For those people not looking at the YouTube video, this is going to be a slightly weird experience, but that's okay. Skip onto the YouTube and watch the podcast there. Sure. So this is an older version of a tool that was developed for HyperNetX to show hypergraphs and be able to interact with them. In this particular diagram, we have a list of papers and there's seven papers and we have the initials of their authors. And so we can see paper zero has two authors. This is a totally made up example. So don't imagine that there's actually an author FM there. But in the diagram, each of these squiggly or weird looking shapes represents a hyper edge. So I'll put a paper four and paper four has seven authors. And notice that paper four shares four authors with paper three. Here's paper three. So they share four offers. So if you can imagine now a huge network where you have maybe a thousand papers, it might be interesting to ask which of these authors was maybe more influential throughout the network than others. So we might look for influential authors. You might look for influential uh, papers if there's some other kind of relationships that were illustrated in the graph. But what you're looking at is really quite simple. It's just a Venn diagram with nodes and hyper edges. So from a simple diagram, you can model something pretty complicated in terms of sets of relationships. So as I look at this, typically a data scientist might do some kind of clustering task where there's some kind of distance between objects or something, or you might use a metric like Jacquard similarity or something. So you could do a similarity measurement between author lists using a metric like that, right? So in some sense, is is one way to think about hypergraphs sort of like a formalism of some of what you might discover using machine learning? Or is it like a a user-specified version of that? Or might you sometimes discover these hypergraphs using methods like clustering and and that kind of thing? Or am I trying to connect two things that just aren't really related here in my head? No. I mean, all of those are concepts that are very prevalent in graph theory, right? We look at clustering. We want to have ways of understanding groups of nodes. So if we think of the multi-way relationships as given to us, so in this case, we're told the papers and the nodes, we can ask questions like, what are the clusters? We often look at clusters in the graph um, according to how connected it is, you know, how connected certain nodes are. But you can do the same thing with hypergraphs. So we can look at clustering nodes according to the relationships they have in the hypergraphs. So that's a connection to clustering. As far as discovering hyperedges, you know, that's a really good question because one of the things that I'm interested in is how do you create a hypergraph from a graph? So if you have a lot of pairwise relationships, can you discover higher order relationships by looking at what those nodes actually represent? So for example, graphs are models of something. And so if we were to look at that, let's say the friend groups, and then we looked at maybe another relationship and we colored the friend groups, say by some association to a club or, you know, their favorite ice cream. I mean, whatever it happens to be, there might be other associations that we might want to highlight in that graph. And so we can do that by just kind of circling. Maybe we have a bunch of relationships. People went to a party. This is where they met. They all met at this party and now they have a relationship. So we're going to put a sort of a circle around those. So if you can imagine having a graph, and from that graph, discovering higher order relationships, that, that kind of fits into the, the discovery side of it. But as far as using the hypergraphs, 
The goal isn't so much to discover the hyper edges as it is to use those hyper edges to better understand the relationships and the nodes. We want to understand the things these graphs or these hypergraphs represent. So the model is just a tool. And this is just, oh, sometimes the hypergraph is really handy because instead of having to look at thousands of graph edges, you might get it down to hundreds of hyper edges. So it's also a way of seeing the forest for the trees, as it were, yeah. making sense of it all. So my background in research is in a sort of an astronomy related field. And I'm thinking about one of the problems you have when you look at the sky is things can be close to each other in angular distance, but they're actually nowhere near each other because it turns out that one of them is like a hundred million light years further behind the other one. And so actually I think in this model, the initial graph you might draw is like how far it is away projected on the sky, but what would make it into a hypergraph would be, well, if I knew the redshift, if I knew the actual distance, the hypergraph then would represent a cluster of objects that are physically close to each other and are gravitationally bound, for example, and that's actually astrophysically real. Whereas just seeing them all projected against each other, you don't have enough information to know without those extra. That's a great example. Okay, cool. Yeah. Right, I get hypergraphs now. These are super cool. And you need to add that as a module to our library where we had to- I, I should probably write up. an example down there. Yeah, you contributor. Yeah, and I can see the case where having a highly connected graph, it can be much easier to model that or much like a lot more space saving by using a hypergraph instead. So I love this visualization from the Hypernet X widget. Can you tell me a bit about Hypernet X itself, the whole project and why you started it? Yeah, I'll go ahead and put the GitHub page up for that. At the time when we were working in hypergraphs, which was, I would say, now we're looking at seven or eight years since I've been working on this project, there really weren't any other libraries around. There were graph libraries. Probably one of the most used one, at least in my area, is NetworkX. And NetworkX is so well written, and it was started by another national lab. And so we started developing these methods for hypergraphs and putting them into Python modules. And so my background had been, when I sort of learned about Python, I had learned quite a bit about open source projects. And I thought, you know, this would be really cool if we could put this on GitHub. And so that whole process got started and we built it to model after NetworkX because we were so impressed by that library. It's well-documented. It mentions the papers that inspired different algorithms. And so we hope that someday we will be able to say that we're on the same level and we're still very much their junior. But as you can see on our webpage, we have quite a few commits. We've been around since 2019 when we first published on PyPy. We also have this very nice read the doc section with lots of information and a full page on it. This was written by Cliff Jocelyn, a gentle introduction to hypergraph mathematics. And he really walks through the differences between graphs and hypergraphs. And so if you are interested, this is where I would go first to just get a sense of what hypergraphs are. So this has been a bit of a labor of love. I often joke with people that HyperNetX has two parents. I'm the mom who stays home and writes the code and Cliff is the dad who goes out to get funding for it. And what we have now is a whole community of people who have provided contributions. So if you go into our library, we have a section in HyperNetX called algorithms. And these algorithms are all opportunities. This is a place where researchers have an opportunity to highlight their work. Sinan Axoy wrote generative uh, models. I wrote the homology module. The hypergraph modularity comes from a, an external contributor, uh, Laplacian clustering. Sinan wrote that. I wrote the centrality measures. And Nicholas Landry, who inspired the XGI hypergraph library, contributed the contagion module. So it's a growing community of people. And I want to mention here, there are other hypergraph libraries. And I just want to say that we all kind of talk to each other because the hypergraph community is growing and we want to support each other and we all have something to contribute. So I actually had a meeting just two days ago with the authors of XGI, Hypergraph X and, and Simple Hypergraphs, which is written in Julia, and also somebody representing Network X. And we're working on an interchange format so that we can standardize how hypergraphs are saved in JSON files and be able to share them across our libraries. I get very excited when I talk about this community because it's fun when you discover something that you can do with a hypergraph and being able to implement it in Python. And then along with the algorithms, we have um, tutorials. So every time somebody creates um, some new ideas, there's a tutorial that goes along with it. So somebody can actually walk into a tutorial and see how it's run. For example, in homology, if you don't know anything about homology, it, it 
that particular tutorial actually walks you through on how to compute homology and then doing it in Python. Hopefully we'll get people to try it out. That's amazing. And this all seems very much in the spirit of open source where you're collaborating with other projects, you're creating the standard to share data and uh, you're adding these tutorials for everything. So I really appreciate that. Um, one thing I like to do before these interviews now lately is look back at that first commit and it was you. <laughs> so that is exciting to see how far along it's come. So HypernetX X has methods specifically for hypergraph analysis. But I think in the paper, I also saw that it has metrics for hypergraphs that don't exist for regular graphs. Things like the width of a relationship, which I thought was super yeah. interesting. Is there anything no. else that really is different about HypernetX? Well, if you think of Venn diagrams, what are Venn diagrams? It's the study of sets. When you think about sets mathematically, you think in terms of the topology, open sets. And when you have open sets, suddenly you can go into new fields of mathematics, which involve algebraic topology, which is beyond the scope of this interview, I know. But because we can use tools in this other sense, that's where homology comes from. And so we can study questions that can be answered only in terms of a topological space. Graphs typically aren't thought of as topological spaces, but hypergraphs are kind of natural because they're already sets. And a topology on a set is just a collection of subsets of a set of things. That's all a topology is. It has certain requirements. So basically, the topology on a set of things called X are just subsets of X that contain all their unions and finite intersections. And it also has the whole set and it has the empty sets. And so I've defined a topology. And you can study the topologies that contain hypergraphs. And you can study hypergraphs in terms of, now we have all these shapes that are defined by these open sets. We can look at how they loop around and what sorts of voids they might have. Suppose you have a whole bunch of steps, right, that are packed around a sphere, right? Because they intersect each other. And so they can actually enclose a two-dimensional ball, right? But they don't fill the ball at all. And so maybe, you know, let's discover what those balls are and why aren't they, you know, what's missing that this side of the ball can't talk to this side of the ball. And these voids can be many different dimensions. So those are topological questions that you can talk about in hypergraphs that you, can't, you don't really talk about in graph theory so much. So that's one thing. And then also in hypernetics in particular, when, what sort of distinguishes us from other libraries is the amount of metadata that you can put on these hypergraphs. So for example, you might want to describe Let's say you have a, a, a small town and there's a lot of parties and you've got a party planner and that party planner has as a hyper edge, a party. And um, inside that party, you have who hosted it. You have um, who, would the, who the entertainment was, where the venue was. You have all this information that you're associating. Kind of think of it as a record. So you imagine this record book of all of these things. And then you have one of these for each of these parties. And you might want to study this landscape of hyper edges in terms of not just their relationships, but also the metadata on top of them. And that's kind of where HyperNet X is distinguished itself from other hypergraph libraries in that we store all of that metadata on the hypergraphs. And then we can ask questions, not just about the relationships of the structural relationships, but also the data relationships between them. And then we can associate metrics with those relationships. So you were asking about what can you do with hypergraphs that you can't necessarily do with graphs? What sorts of metrics? One of them is that you've got this data that you can put on top of it. One of them is this topological angle. And then as you mentioned initially, there's this S width. So when you talk about two hyper edges intersecting, they can intersect in multiple nodes. And that intersection size is the width of the intersection. So we can talk about a path going from one hyper edge to another hyper edge. And then we can talk about the width of that path according to the size of the intersections. Well, now when you talk about a path, you can talk about things like distance. What's the distance between two hyper edges? And that distance might require the width of the paths to have some minimal number. So you might have what's called an S distance. So now we look at the distance between two hyper edges if the width has to be at least two or three. So that's the S distance. So yeah, there's a whole slew of things that we can do with hypergraphs. And a lot of researchers have explored these things. There's also, of course, learning hyperedges in machine learning, which we haven't been doing yet, but that's an area that we'd like to investigate. I did see the thing about metadata in the paper, but I don't think I grasped it until you were talking about that example. So thank you for that. Yeah. 
and it's useful. So it sounds like they're really rich tool, if that's the right word to use or a methodological approach. What are communities where researchers most resonate with these use cases outside of just the study of hypergraphs, which I'm guessing is a thing as well, but where do people apply them? One of the early applications was in studying proteins. So you have protein reactions. And so what we were looking at were gene expressions and we published on that. And so essentially a hyperedge was associated with a particular virus. And we were looking at the proteins that were expressed in a sample of that virus. And then once we had those protein expressions, we looked at other uh, viruses and other samples. And so we looked at a whole network of samples in terms of those things. And that's something you can't just do with a, uh, a graph because it's the interactions of many proteins that were important. And then another example might be DNS data, for example, domain name services. If you want to look at IP addresses and their domain names, a single domain name could have multiple IP addresses. And similarly, the same IP address could be associated with multiple domain names. And so you might want to study a network in terms of those associations, those many-to-many -many associations. One of the things that's fun to play with and is interesting, too, in terms of bibliometrics is to look at, let's say, archive data. And you want to study papers and those papers that have authors. And you look at the landscape of these authors um, and papers over time. How do, how do things change over time? The, the subject matters of, for example, machine learning is so dynamic. And you can look over time to look at the landscape of the papers in terms of the authors and how an author's interest changed over time. Really, any situation where you have many-to-many -many relationships. I think graph networks, if you go on, for example, Wikidata has a huge knowledge graph or property graph of data that you can find if you go online. And that's a big graph. It just associates the IDs of people with their relationships to different things. Could be to colleges or whether they're married, you know, all sorts of associations. So if you imagine that huge knowledge graph, it's interesting to ask about, you know, if you take a wiki data for a single person, treat that as a hyper edge. And then you can take all of those wiki data pages and look at them as hyper edges in a huge hypergraph and be able to common relationships there. So again, it's a tool to model data. And so, you know, in the gene expression, we were interested in knowing which genes were the most prevalent and important to those particular examples. In a DNS, we might look for aberrant behavior or is there some malware involved possibly somewhere? And the way you discover things often in data science is just looking for anomalies, looking for things that are different than other things. Great. Yeah, it's amazing. And speaking of Wikidata and these biological systems, how large of a graph could I model with HyperNetX? Like, how does the scale? Very good question. And that's always a problem because if you think about it, graphs, as they grow, you're only growing by multiples of two, right? If you start working with hypergraphs, it's two to the power of however nodes you have. So it's just, it, instead of n squared, it's two to the n. HyperNetX can comfortably handle up to about a million nodes. Last night, I wanted to test it just so I could give you a better idea. I had a two million node HyperEdge, actually with two million relationships. It took me about three minutes to instantiate a hypergraph with two million nodes and uh, about a minute to compute the connected components of that hypergraph. So that gives you an idea. And that's small. Two million nodes is a toy in most cases. So in order to scale this, we really need to use something that's a little more powerful. We are working with some other languages like Rust to see if we can scale it up. Simple hypergraph, which is written in Julia, does scale to a much larger graph, but that it doesn't hold data, which again is one of the reasons we're talking to all the other hypergraph libraries because some of them scale better than HyperNetX. We hold data a little bit better and have certain tools that they don't have. But in terms of if you just want to use HyperNetX, the Viz tools are only going to work on small graphs. We do have drawing tools. You can look at, at diagrams of hypergraphs, but you get an absolute hairball if you try to do it with too many nodes. But as far as the metrics, I would stick to probably less than a million if you want to get any performance at all. And is that on your local machine? That's on my local machine. You would have to rewrite some of the tools to get anything off the CPU if you wanted to use anything more extravagant. We haven't done that. Yeah. So it, it sounds like it's fairly sort of computationally traditional in the sense it's like CPU and RAM and whatever you've got on the machine. That's what you're going to, those are the upper bounds by the sense of things. Yeah. And, and in fairness, the data sets that we were studying weren't that big. Oftentimes the biological data that we were using, we had CSV files that weren't even that big. But when you start looking at, say, the wiki data, and you want to look at those as nodes, 
that is huge. And so we would subset it out to study it in hypernetics. And most data science, I mean, your brain can only handle a whole bunch at once, right? So oftentimes you can only handle so much data and inspecting so much data at a time anyways. Yeah, that makes sense. I wondered if we could skip a little bit to talking about the JOS process. I was just curious what the review was like for you. Did, did, you, did you all have a good time? Like what was the experience of, and why did you choose to publish in JOS? That was interesting because another Hypergraph library, XGI, Nicholas Landry, asked me to publish in JOS because he wanted to cite our library. He said, you know, the process is, is really straightforward. They're very fast with their reviews. It's a great journal to get in and to highlight our library because we didn't have a formal publication on HNX. And so the process was pretty straightforward. We did have one reviewer who really went through our library and found every single thing, you know, it, uh, in terms of formatting, syntax, he found some bugs. So we spent a lot of time cleaning things up so that uh, we could please the particular reviewer, which was good. It, it kind of opened our eyes to a couple of things that we hadn't been paying attention to. It forced us to be a little bit more professional and, and less researchy. And um, so the JAWS process overall, I have to really praise it. Um, I have submitted things to journals where I didn't hear back from them for a year and I heard back from them very quickly. I think it was, you know, within a couple of weeks of submitting. We're definitely um, faster than a year, but yeah, so that's good to hear. Cool. And looking at the software, you do have quite a few contributors on GitHub. So what kind of skills do people need if they want to jump in and help you and how do they get started? That is a great question. We're starting to get more pull requests. So I think that to really get into it, you have to really know how to write Python code, obviously. And we do have relatively high standards for just the syntax and being able to have adequate comments. We have a standard way of doing that. You can look at our read the docs page to get a sense of how to contribute. The main contributions we're seeking, though, would be in the area of algorithms. And so researchers who are working in hypergraphs, particularly those that are using our library in order to conduct experiments or just to do visualizations for their papers, if they have tools that they would like to see promoted, then the best way to do that is to write an algorithms module and a tutorial so people can use it. You know, it's great when people find errors. It's easiest for us if you just post an issue and say, I found this error, would you fix it? Here's how you reproduce the error. Fixing the core code is something that at this point in time, it's really hard to coordinate with people on the outside. But if we just had a pull request for someone who has uh, some ways of doing hypergraph matching. And so we're going to get that into the library. She's got a tutorial that she just uh, did a pull request on this morning. And that kind of a contribution is just fabulous because that's how people learn about hypergraphs and that's how students and new researchers in the field can find out what you're doing and it's much easier to learn to read a paper if you can look at a tutorial which actually works out the details for you and shows you how to apply it yeah for sure so it sounds like contributions to like algorithms that makes a ton of sense are there other kind of core features that you think are missing for the library that you're as the core team looking at adding or is, is that really just of what you're looking for now, these extensions around new algorithms? Well, some ideas. We're looking at directed hypergraphs and, you know, how do we put things, let's say if we're going to describe a hyper edge, we might want to have it to be a directed hyper edge, meaning we have head nodes and tail nodes. And what should that structure look like? I mean, ideas around the kinds of structure these hyper edges could be, you could have the nodes in them ordered, for example. The hyper edges could be ordered. Uh, you could have a pattern, say, uh, for example, in, when I was talking about the party planner, you could have a hyper edge and every hyper edge in her hypergraph has to have who paid for the party, a venue, and those things. So, you know, there might be a pattern of what has to be in a hyper edge of a particular type. So, you know, if you start thinking of, of hyper edges as more than just a Venn diagram, but actually as containers which hold information about a collection of objects. And then we relate those containers. There's all sorts of structure that you can put on them. And so ideas about that, you know, and again, tutorials, um, Jupyter notebooks are the best way to promote ideas and things like that. And we definitely embraced, again, I think I'm still sharing the tutorials that we have. Oh, here we go. We have basic tutorials, which show you how to use the library. We have advanced tutorials about how to apply different modules. But if there's particular applications that people have found, I would love to add another folder that says external 
ideas or design ideas. The library is intended to be a tool to be used by the community. So if you have an idea, send us an issue and post it, and I'd love to try it out. That's awesome. So how can people keep up to date with HypernetX? I would just follow us on GitHub. Whenever there's something changed, I, you know, just go up and put a watch on. I guess you in notifications, once you sign in, you can put a watch on it. And yeah, that's the best way. We don't really have a web page yet, except for the Read the Docs page. We don't have anything more fancy than that. It's all you need. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much, Bretta. It's been great learning about Hypernet X and everything that you've been doing here. This has been great. It's been really fun. Thanks for teaching us about hypergraphs. I wish I was more actively doing research. I would be going and playing with them next, I think. I want to see an astrophysics example. I think that would be wild. I will send this recording to some folks that I know who might be uh, pretty motivated to do that. So let's see if I can get them interested. Thank you so much for listening to Open Source for Researchers. We showcase open source software built by and for researchers. You can hear more by subscribing in your favorite podcast app. The Journal of Open Source Software is a community-run journal relying on volunteer effort. If you'd like to support Joss, please consider making a small donation towards running costs at numfocus.org slash donate to Joss. That's N-U-M-F-O-C-U-S dot org slash donate dash to dash J-O-S-S. Open Source for Researchers is produced and hosted by Arthur Smith and me, Abby Kibunak-Mays. Edited by Abby and music CC by Boxcat. <laughs>